All right, welcome back to another episode of Charge 4 with Chargebacks 911. I am your host, Justin Clemens. Uh, today, I'm joined by Kellen Rayner. He's the Vice President of Sales at Bankful. They provide payment processing and merchant gateway services to businesses large and small. Kellen, thanks so much for coming on today. Uh, just real quick for our audience, would you mind telling us just a little bit about yourself and the company? Yeah, thank you, Justin. Happy to be here. Hey, Justin said, my name is Kellen Rayner. I'm the VP of sales here at Bankful. Uh, we're a full service payment service provider specializing in high risk. Um, we provide a soup to nuts solution for the payment processing industry. Um, you know, our gateway platform offers a comprehensive suite of services, uh, including chargeback management, uh, fraud tools, digital wallets, subscriptions, processing, some AI, um, full, full suite. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, with that, let's dive into it. Um, so real quick, before we get into the weeds, I just kind of want to go over some uh, some stats and lay out, lay out the foundation from last year's holiday shopping season and what we can expect in this year's holiday shopping season. Always deemed the golden quarter for retailers, uh, just because that's when everybody typically sees their spike in sales go on, uh, typically from November 1st all the way through the end of December. So just taking a look at some of these stats, we see that uh, consumers spent nearly a trillion dollars during the holiday season last year. So $964 billion. And that's a 3.8% increase from 2022. And it set a record for most spent during that golden quarter. Uh, looking particularly at online sales, the online holiday sales, they increased by nearly 5% to about $221 billion, uh, with mobile shopping t- making up more than half of those online sales. Now, that's really important because most of the chargebacks and post-transaction disputes happen with card not present transactions. Uh, so that's something to be mindful of that we see that that's making up the majority of the sales. And probably as we uh, look year over year, that's only gonna, going to increase. Um, another interesting fact that we saw uh, is that Gen Z consumers spent 15% more uh, in 2023 than they did the year previously, which is the largest percentage increase group. This is important because Gen Z uses mobile banking apps far more than any of their of the other age groups uh, that are that are sort of in the um, you know that are making these purchases. So uh, if we're if we're looking at chargebacks and if you're a merchant trying to avoid chargebacks and and instead have consumers go through refunds for you um, or go getting refunds through you. Uh, it's important to look at this age demographic because these are the ones who are doing, you know, the the one click mobile app disputes with their banks. They they feel much more comfortable going through them due to understanding and convenience. So it's important that not only this year but but moving forward, keeping an eye on this age group um, as they kind of you know as they become more involved in the purchasing cycle. Uh, so it's always good to look at. And looking ahead at this year, we see that uh, U.S. holiday retail specifically for e-commerce sales are, are expected to break records this, again this year, uh, reaching 271 and a half billion. And that's going to be a 9.5% increase from 2023. So just giving you the groundwork of what we saw last year, what to expect this year. Um, and, and, you know, these year over year trends are probably going to continue. So real quick before, before, you know, diving in too much, let's, we wanted to take a look at high risk industries. The reason why we want to look at, at these particular sectors is because these uh, companies that operate within these fields, they often see chargebacks at higher rates than they do for other ones. So just kind of looking at what these industries entail, um, these are folks who need to be kind of doing that proactive work even more so than your typical retailer merchant. Everybody should be playing and managing and, uh, and looking at chargebacks, especially those of friendly fraud. Uh, but these industries in particular. So, you know, we see those companies that are uh, heavily reliant on recurring payments, subscription services, um, anything that offers free trial services, uh, those that use affiliate marketing or drop shipping, um, th- those where you kind of have elements of your business that are in third parties' hands. Uh, sometimes miscommunication can happen, uh, products arrive that aren't as described, those sorts of things. Uh, nutraceutical and cosmetic companies, uh, telemarketing, calling cards. We see casinos, gambling, gaming, especially for those who place losing bets. So we can see that. Um, the pharmaceutical in- industries, online drug providers, um, adult entertainment, dating services, 
Uh, and then we see the travel industries, which I saw we had some pre-submitted questions from a few uh, of those in the travel and hospitality industries, which we'll tackle later on. Um, Kellen, from from the payment processing standpoint, uh, can you kind of take us in? Is there is, is there anything we left off this list, or is there any of these industries on this list that you know are are especially susceptible to disputes to to chargebacks? You can weigh in on that. I mean, it's it's a it's probably the most common question that we get from uh, a merchant is why am I being classified as high risk, especially if you're not in any of these particular industries. And really, the the short answer is it is you know the banks are really the ones the underwriting departments at the banks are the ones who really determine you know what the what they consider high risk, and every single bank is going to calculate that differently. But the most common thing that they have is there's three types of risk that they all share. One is equity risk, the second's reputational risk, and the three is regulatory risk. Now. You know, I think any vertical can really be classified in an equity risk standpoint. And a lot of those are small market businesses that don't have a lot of, you know, liquidity in the bank. But the bank's just afraid that they're not going to be able to collect on any chargebacks, maybe not get the fees. Um, Reputational has to do a lot with what you see over here. You know, adult industry specific, you know, it's like the banks are worried about the moral concern associated with it. Firearms, people are, you know, they are worried about gun violence, CBDs, association with drug use, uh, and gambling, like you said. Not, nobody likes to lose, so why not charge that back as a tactic? So it's a very common question, and you know it's, it's a case-by-case basis per each bank. So finding the right partner um, that can educate you on how to get that account approved, kind of what the landscape looks like, um, is the best practice to have a really good understanding of what high risk is and how it functions and how you can play in that field successfully. Gotcha. Yeah, thank you for that. And then, yeah, those those three categories are especially important. You know, a lot of people are aware of the financial fallout from from even like disputes and chargebacks, but there's obviously that reputational damage. And then, you know, if you're not CPI compliant, there's there's consequences yeah. of that too. And the, yeah. the regulatory issue, I mean, uh, the, the fines, you know, there's a lot of industries like CBD that, you know, are beholden to the, uh, you know, the 0.3% THC threshold. Mm-hmm. You know, exceeding that can part, you know, you can get some some uh, fines there. Um, you know, so there's, it's a, it's a wide variety. So it is a case by case basis. And like I said, just each bank is going to calculate their risk just a little bit different. All right, so so Kellen, I want I know you got this is this is definitely in your realm. I, I'm curious as to how you know for those merchants that are on the call, uh, how can high risk industries how can they get approved for payment processing if they use is some of the tactics that we just went over, or if they fall into one of those industries that we just named? Right. A first and foremost, uh, partnerships are everything. Right. You can't really succeed and 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 have a long, late, lengthy, healthy business without the right partners in right? Mm -hmm. So it makes a huge difference. So finding a, a well established, trusted payment processor is super important because they will help you small market, uh, startup enterprise merchants. It's a very different landscape. It behaves very differently than a brick and mortar business would. And then it's also the same in regarding to a, a brick and mortar business, but partnerships are everything. So make sure you do your research um, and you find someone you can trust, right? Second, mm-hmm. you know, like I said at the beginning of the call, every bank is going to calculate risk differently. So when you partner up with somebody that has a lot of options, they can, you know, help you get there. So because banks calculate risk differently, they're going to have, you know, underwriting requests. And it's important to be malleable to those requests because this is a, a new relationship for you. It's a new relationship for the bank. And all relationships develop with trust levels, right? So mm-hmm. just because there's a uh, a run an underwriting ask at the beginning doesn't mean it will always be there. And if you have a trusted partner, they can help you alleviate those asks as your business goes on. But being very valuable to those requests is definitely a great way to get you that processing uh, mm-hmm. compliant. You know, we when you're dealing with high risk, whether you're a firearms merchant, um, an adult industry. Uh, you're in CBD. There are all these different thresholds or you know check marks that you have to cover. You can't exceed 0.3 percent. It's some you know with, with banks, 
Um, you have to have a uh, tobacco and firearms license to sell those products. So making sure that your website's compliant um, and your products are compliant with those regular, uh, with the, with the rules is definitely important because, you know, they may ask you to remove products. You just want to be buttoned up when you get there. And then the pay, your, your, your payment service provider will help you. We'll, we'll vet your website. We'll have a good conversation. We'll say, Hey, you know, this, uh, we might need to remove this, or I think this looks good, so on and so forth. But it's a, it's, it's a, you know, good to be buttoned up in that. Mm-hmm. And then strong customer relationships. If you're looking for, uh, if you're wanting to see what market rates like, you've been processing payments for an extremely long time. You may be in uh, firearms. You may be in CBD. Banks are going to look at your reviews. They're going to see what your BBB ratings like. They're going to see what your Google rate ratings like. Yelp, so on and so forth. So having a strong customer service department, having testimonials and great reviews, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it, I know that that can be a struggle for merchants sometimes. But yeah, if you can find folks to give you a good review uh, right. and people talking about your product, that's gonna that's gonna add to the you know your, your legitimacy because nothing uh, nothing resonates better with other consumers than consumer testimonials. So no, that's that's a great point. Kind of looking into some of the uh, alternative payment methods that we see gaining in popularity, especially over the last year. Um, the biggest one that we see that merchants have adopted based off of what consumers are using most is digital wallets. So we definitely wanted to dedicate some time in this webinar to kind of going over digital wallets specifically uh, and some of the benefits behind those, how they can increase those conversions. Uh, so we want to just dive in just a little bit. So uh, if if you are um, if you are a merchant and you're and you're doing business, you know, through e-commerce, you're doing it online. Uh, digital wallets are very big right now, especially for their added security and their use of tokenization. So it's something that, uh, both from a security and convenience standpoint, a lot of merchants are adopting, um, just some of the benefits that we see, um, faster checkout processes, uh, you know, not having to put all your card information each time you make a purchase, especially if you're going to different stores this holiday season, uh, something that, uh, consumers look to use more and more. Um, increased trust and security. Again, the the using those the the encryption and tokenization that they have uh, makes that transaction more secure. Uh, it's going to make customers feel comfortable shopping with you. They you know they see that you're adopting new technology that they're more prone to use. Um, the mobile optimization. We do see uh, more and more folks shopping through their phones. So having that you know that those those wallets through the apps on their phone, uh, it's going to make it's going to make so you have less abandoned carts uh, if they can, you know, just a couple clicks on their phone from completing that checkout process. Uh, we see reduced payment errors, uh, you know, with that stored information. We see that, you know, there's they're less likely to put in the wrong, uh, you know, expiration date or the um, the security code on their card. Uh, again, all that ease of, of shortening that time that they spend at checkout um, and the fact that they support multiple payment options. Uh, so, you know, if you're, you know, if for some reason a card gets declined because of insufficient funds or, uh, you know, the, the, uh, a transaction is recognized or the, or the bank might flag it, um, using that, the, those digital wallets, so they can pull out another card just as quickly, just as easily and, and, and use it for that. Um, you know, Kellen, from your standpoint, from the, from the folks that you work with is, is digital wallets, is that, is that the new wave? Is it, is it something that, uh, merchants are going to be looking to implement implement more and more, like we're seeing from our surveys. Uh, can you shed us shed yeah, a little light on that? It's a big ask. It's probably, I mean, outside of why am I high risk, classified as high risk is do you have digital wallets available? Because yeah. of the ease of use, right? Um, everything is done on a digital device these days. It improves the customer experience. Uh, there's a global reach aspect to it that, you know, it makes it easier to process transactions if you're marketing into different countries and it's fast and it, you know, um, it takes away a lot of the, like you said, of having to go find that other card. Oh, my wallet's in the other room. I got to go walk over there. You might abandon that card mm-hmm. and go do something else. But mm-hmm. with the fact you have that digital wallet and those multiple payment options inside of your cell phone or connected to your computer makes it easy to 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 finish that transaction. We kind of wanted to get into the realm of friendly fraud, uh, right? So 
uh, this can kind of constitute chargeback abuse or misuse. Uh, there, there are some, there, there are a lot of different categories that that can fall under friendly fraud uh, for when those ch- those disputes and those chargebacks arise. Unfortunately, for merchants today, you are competing with the issuing bank for convenience. Uh, we did a cardholder survey back earlier this year called the uh, Cardholder Dispute Index. Um, you know, where we see that you know a lot of these cardholders are going straight to their bank without contacting the merchant, and they're doing so because it's convenient. Their bank is more understanding and empathetic. Uh, they get results right away. Sometimes they get a refund same day, if not within a few business days. Uh, the vast majority of the time. So it's something that you're really that you. It, it's tough to keep up with in terms of being the first step in a dispute for a cardholder because we see today that they're contacting the bank. So being able to detect friendly fraud and when that's happening is is huge. So if, if you're a merchant taking it upon yourself, uh, one thing you want to do is you want to review chargeback reason codes. You want to get to know them in general and, and different card networks have different reason codes, but you want to be up to speed on what those reason codes are. And then when those disputes come in, you want to be able to see what the, you know, what's the reason code that it's file, filed under. Uh, and you want to t- go back and take a look at like the customer history as well. You want to see if that if this is a repeat customer that's had a, a one-off bad experience, did they get something that wasn't as advertised. Uh, those were um, getting that knowledge of what those reason codes entail and being able to see when they come in, what, you know, it, is this going to be more of an instance of friendly fraud uh, or if it's not. Uh, another thing is is looking at those discrepancies in communication, right? So if you're if you're noticing that these complaints are are inconsistent, if you see that you're getting a complaint about a particular product that really doesn't associate with the product at all, um, you know this wasn't the type of product that I wanted in this category, but that's the only kind that you offer. Um, uh, those those sorts of things where if you know your product and you know your processes, uh, that that's something where some of those red flags can be very apparent. Uh, and again, just understanding what those reason codes are uh, and and where they're coming in at. Not only that, but if it is something where it's on the merchant side, you can also use that to optimize some of your business practices. Um, you know, if if it's something where you've experienced a, a delay in in shipping um, or or delivery doesn't go well, uh, and and you you have a run with who, whoever your your partner is for that for delivering those packages is is slow or delaying. Uh, sometimes chargebacks can arise from there. So being able to find out and clearly communicating with your customers when there's going to be a shipping delay, when they can expect their packages, that's that's going to help sort of deter that because just because a product is delayed doesn't necessarily mean that the cardholder has a right to get their money back straight away or that's a disputable charge. Um, another thing to look at is those behavioral red flags. So we kind of touched on this a few times, but those high value purchases. Um, unfamiliar or unusual activity. This is where you're going back and looking at the shipping and uh, um, the billing address. You know how how different are they? Those sorts of things. So uh, you want to be able to take a look at um, friendly fraud from from that standpoint. So you already know your business, but now being able to see from a dispute standpoint, what's what's something that's affiliated with your business and what's something that doesn't and might be a case of an illegitimate chargeback. So that's that's sort of some of the the things to look at to detect that friendly fraud. Now going into preventing that friendly fraud, um, you know, and Kellen, I'd, I'd love to hear what you think about this as we go through them. Um, so one huge thing is having clear and detailed descriptions. Uh, one for your product, you want to make sure that you provide dimensions for your product. I'm sure we all ordered something off of Amazon that we thought was one size, and it comes in either much smaller or bigger. Uh, you want to be clear with your product descriptions. That way, that is not uh, a reason code that can be filed for that. You want to be clear upfront about what it is that they're buying. The, another big one, and this is something that you know it, it doesn't take much effort but could prevent a lot of chargebacks, is being able to update your billing descriptor so it's recognizable and relates to, to your business. Um, one of the things that we see when we surveyed those cardholders we saw that the leading cause of of friendly fraud and and chargeback misuse was uh, cardholders not recognizing the billing descriptor on their statement. Now, while some of those may have been instances of fraud, they're 
card information got stolen, something was bought uh, without their approval, that that could happen. But uh, but a lot of those are coming from they bought something from a store. The merchant isn't up to speed with what their billing descriptor looks like, or they don't know how to change it. So they see something that comes in and it might be a phone number. It, it could be something where it's not the, it's not the name that they're doing business under. They see that they don't recognize that charge. And then they immediately call their bank. This is something where if you just contact, uh, you know, your, your, your merchant account rep, uh, something to take a look at that billing descriptor and change it to something that's recognizable with your storefront. It's something that's going to alleviate chargebacks, especially if you're getting a lot of those for uh, for legitimate purposes where you can't find any other reason than they don't recognize the transaction. I think that's a big one. I mean, the billing descriptors can eliminate a lot of chargebacks. We we talk about this a lot when we're on the phone with our merchants. We were seeing this a lot with sole proprietors. You know, they would have their names as the billing descriptor. When you're going through your 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 bank app and you're like, oh, what's this Kellen Rayner? And you don't even need to call your bank sometimes. You could just go into that transaction and refute it right there in your app and have a charge back in seconds. So yeah. that, that that's probably, you know, the big one. Obviously, selling your product, delivering it as it is advertised is definitely a very important thing. If you're selling clothing, it's really important to have, you know, your your uh, size dimensions on your website. Um, mm-hmm. Detail, 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 detail. Remind them, or, or remind your customer, and let them know what they're getting, who are they getting it from, when it's going to be delivered. Yeah, and even for billing descriptors, depending on the length of your name, it might be a good idea to even put the phone number for your customer service line in that billing descriptor. Right. That way, you know, there, there's their their call to action right there, as opposed to a couple clicks of disputing the charge with their bank. They could just see that phone number and give you a call instead. So something to think about. Um, uh, something else for preventative measures, uh, having a responsive and understanding customer support. We already hit on you are competing with issuing banks for convenience. It is it is much easier for the cardholder to call their bank and get that refund in their account either instantaneously or the next day. So you want to make sure that you are making yourself as available as possible. So having that proactive support, sending post-purchase follow-up emails. Uh, you want to confirm that they're satisfied with the product. Um having that easy access to customer service. This is something where machine learning uh, really helps. If you can uh, incorporate some sort of, um, you know, uh, customer service bot. So somebody's already al- always responding and filing any sort of dispute before they can contact the bank. You just want to make yourself available at, at all times. So you, you can't necessarily have an employee on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but that's where some of these machine learning tools really help. Um, and also having those uh, refund policies uh, having them not be uh, so strict that it leaves the cardholder with no other option than contacting their issuing bank. You want to have friendly refund policies. You want to make it so that they come back to you and don't just keep the product and get the money back. And then you're left with those fees and penalties and, and everything like that. So you want to make sure that your refund policies are also empathetic to the cardholder. Right. I think we all want to be treated you know, the same way. I mean, we're, we're, we're consumers as much as we are business uh, folks. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. So when I look at my buying behavior, I like to purchase from companies that will, you know, be malleable to certain things. Obviously I'm not going to go back and return everything, but friendly refund policies. I think we're, we, we compete a lot against big brands, right? Costco, Nordstrom's all have really, really big refund policies. And every time we encounter um, a merchant that does not have one, it's important to say, you know, you know, understand the reasons why. And it, not everything is is products could sold. Some of it might be, uh, you know, seminars or they might be, uh, you know, uh, like coaching and, and stuff like that. So, you know, mm-hmm. having some form of conversation of, hey, this wasn't exactly what I was getting, you know, that dialogue is important. So it's always uh, important to make sure that they're calling you first because mm-hmm. and then that having really good support in general right because i think in in any aspect we can only support the weight that we can hold mm-hmm. so having a if you can have you know one two three people able to help you with these with these claims especially in the holiday season when your transactions are going to increase so much right right 
Um, the next phase of that, right after the transaction happens, when that product goes out the door, right? So the shipping and delivery verification. A lot of times we see for reason codes for chargebacks that come in is product not delivered. Um, this is where, you know, especially if this is a, a case of chargeback abuse, um, you know, chargeback fraud, as it can be referred to sometimes, uh, this is something where having that delivery partner, having that proof of delivery, so using those tracking numbers, getting the signature upon delivery, uh, those sort of things, um, photo evidence, if uh, if Amazon or uh, UPS, USPS, if they're delivering it and you uh, and you require them to take a photo of the package being dropped off, all these things can be used uh, in the re-presentment process. If a chargeback is filed, you can submit that as compelling evidence. And that's something that could, that might help get that dispute overturned. That might get that chargeback overturned uh, in your favor. So being able to have uh, you know so the proof that something was delivered, it, here it is on their front doorstep, or here's their signature signing off for it. This is something that it, it, that will go a long way if you receive a chargeback that you know that that was delivered, everything went through correctly, um, and that's something that you can use to submit. Right. Proof of delivery is a great log. Having, uh, you know, signature upon delivery, depending on how much the, the consumer is buying. I mean, it's all evidence that will help you be successful in any, you know, any chargeback you're trying to uh, fight. Mm-hmm. Um, and the last thing we, we, we touched on it a little bit, but uh, utilizing chargeback alerts and management. Um, so, again, those chargeback alerts, like we said, those when that when that chargeback happens, you you, you pay the fee. You get the ding on your merchant account, and neither of those are reversible, even if it, it comes to light that it was a fraudulent chargeback. Um, so it's something where you set up that alert. You can you can avoid that from from the get go, especially if it's something that's on the on the merchant side, or if you see that it comes through and you're like, no, this we have all the evidence that shows that this is um, that this was a legitimate transaction. It at least helps you prepare because those sometimes those those turnaround times, the window for the merchant to respond to a chargeback, they they can be pretty short depending on the card network that it's going through. So, uh, kind of getting a heads up to okay, here's here's a dispute that's coming down the pike. Uh, it, it helps you prepare, and then also you know you having chargeback management, uh, having a service uh, or some sort of uh, software in place for that. That can help you during the the representment process. We kind of went over how you know these rules and regulations they change all the time. You know, at, at least twice a year are there major card updates, or there are uh, new systems in place. Uh, we saw Visa Institute Compelling Evidence 3.0. Uh, Mastercard is about to roll something out uh, the, the, to a similar regard. But these things happen all the time, and if you're focused on business development, it's tough to keep up with all those rules and regulations. So. If you do decide to go with like a third party or using a platform that's that's monitored by chargeback experts, it's it's something where you can sort of take the responsibility and everything that you need to do to stay on top of the payments and card industry. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of resources putting that into the hands of somebody who it does it every day and whose whole you know purpose in in their in their professional life is keeping up with these rules and regulatory changes and making sure that the system that that merchant is operating through is up to date and compliant. Uh, it's something that can take a lot of weight off. It, it all depends on what your transaction volume is or what your chargeback rate is uh, as to whether or not you might need it. But if it's something that's sort of getting out of hand or you're falling behind in, uh, the, in the new processes that these card networks are, are implementing, it's just, it's something to keep in mind and to take a look at. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, the best way to handle any type of situation, you know, to avoid panic is being well prepared, having the documentation. You know, you have a brick and mortar store, you're going to have an alarm system set up to prevent you from break-ins, right? You're going to have an e-commerce store, you should have alerts set up so you can act in real time in case you need to pull back a delivery. Call the carrier and say, hey, I need to pull this back. You know, I got a charge back whatever the case may be. It's all about having time to prepare, being alerted when things, um, you know, arise. So you can have the time to behave and act in a way where you can handle these things uh, efficiently. We're going to go ahead and tackle some questions here real quick. Um, uh, some that we had gotten submitted beforehand. So, you know, we'll we'll dive into those. Uh, first, Kellen, let's, uh, let's dive into some of these submitted questions really quick. Great. Um, the first one we have, they ask, uh, 
what are best practices for protecting businesses from friendly fraud, friendly fraud while also protecting customer experience? That is the that's the tightrope that merchants who you know are you know have chargeback prevention and management processes in place. In place, that's the tightrope that they that they walk. How do you uh, put up enough restrictions while not putting up too much friction? It's it's a balance that's kind of it's different for each merchant depending on the product that they sell, their transaction volume, uh, and everything like that. But we kind of we went over best best practices a little bit. Um, but, but mainly I think the, you know, the biggest thing that we can suggest is, is again, those, those chargeback alerts, uh, letting you know what is coming down the pike in terms of if there's a dispute that has the risen that hasn't turned into a chargeback already, being able to head that off at the pass or it, it causes damage to your merchant account, uh, or, or reputational damage being able to to solve a cardholder's dispute, especially if it's something on the on the side of merchant error, uh, that's something that you want to be able to do. Um, and to be able to have those safeguards in place to not disrupt customer experience as well. That's why we kind of touched on digital wallets and tokenization. That's something that already comes with its own protection features uh, to where you don't have to put up any, you know, you don't have to put up additional safeguards that, those digital wallets already have in place. So you're not setting up more friction. You're, you're avoiding, uh, you know, uh, cart abandonment at checkout, those sorts of things like that. And the other thing that we would recommend is responding to all chargebacks, even if it's one that's valid, it's, you know, it was merchant error, uh, being able to take a look at those chargebacks and responding to them. There are, you know, chargebacks are a burden, but there is, blessings in them that you can take a look at that data has a lot of key information either if it's a policy that's being taken advantage of that you have in your system that's something that you can shore up uh if it's something to do with your customer service if you got if it's not being as responsive as it needs to be and that's the sort of feedback you're getting uh there's just there it, chargeback data has its weight in gold as far as optimizing your business and finding out where to shore up those those leaks in revenue if you will yeah, um, it goes a long way with your processor as well. <clears throat> if they see that you're actually yes. engaged in managing those chargebacks, they feel a lot more comfortable with your business model. So you'll have a little mm-hmm. bit more runway, um, and you'd be surprised. You can get quite a bit reversed. You know, on top of that, mm-hmm. like we talked about earlier, communication, transparency policies, just making sure all your terms and conditions are, are, are there, your billing descriptors are up, uh, mm-hmm. and just ensure that you have a favorable or fair return policy in case it ever gets down to that. But technology and customer service really go all hand in hand. Right, right. Yeah, definitely communicate with your customers. I mean, whether it's tracking or uh, following up with them on their satisfaction, it's, it's something that can that can help out a lot. Um, and and also your payment processor, they're going to have more knowledge on what's happening, definitely on the on the regulatory side or what's going on with the card networks. Um you know, there's there's updates every day. the The industry is 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 it's moving. It, it might be slowly, but it's moving to recognize that friendly fraud and illegitimate uh, chargebacks are a big issue, and they are working to sort of balance the scales a little bit. So, your your payment processor can have you know sort of those those updates and those key insights of what can be submitted, what you have to use to your advantage. So, um, that's a great point, Kellen. Um, all right, next question we have is. How do I win no show chargebacks? I think this is coming from someone in the hotel and lodging yeah. industry. Um, so I think this goes back to commit, and I'll, I'll pass this over to you, Kellen. But I think this goes back to communication. Big you you want to be up up front with your with your terms and conditions at checkout, and also in the email that gets sent to uh, those patrons that are that are visiting your establishment. That you know that confirmation email that also lists out what your parameters are for you know if there's a no show charge that you have uh you know if somebody booked a hotel didn't show up you charge them that no show fee and they charge that back you want to have clear and concise uh language around what that what those no show fees are and that can be used uh, to submit as compelling evidence too to overturn that saying hey this was this language was was very apparent this cardholder knew that this was, this was part of the transaction whenever they completed it. Right. Like 
you know, we staff up based on reservations, right? Mm-hmm. You could be adding 25% to your overhead just because you have quite a bit of people that are booking at your hotel or booking, you know, for, for the plane or for the restaurant. So mm-hmm. just like with subscriptions, you know, it's really important to, you know, send a reminder a week before, talk about your, you know, have a clear cancellation and no-show policy that they agree to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the reminders are the really big thing, but, you know, having that compelling evidence uh, will go a long way with the chargebacks. I mean, there's a lot, people usually book very far in advance. So, you know, a lot of things can happen. So sending, keeping them in the loop of what's going on is extremely important. Maybe having a cancellation policy where, you know, if you're booking so far out, you know, uh, a full refund after three months, and then it goes down from there. But it's it, it goes to reminders, communication, um, customer service. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Our next question that we have is, what is the chargeback risk with digital wallets? Um, right off the bat, I wouldn't say that there's necessarily a chargeback risk specifically with digital wallets. Um, I mean, obviously, any form of payment that you use is going to have just inherently, it's going to have a risk of chargeback just right. from things outside of the payment method. Uh, but I think if anything, these digital wallets are going to help decrease the risk of chargebacks, especially, um, you know, for for encrypting that data, as we were talking about before, the tokenization uh, that these digital wallets utilize. Uh, it's going to be something that's going to prevent, you know, it, you know, if there's any breach in security or you have some sort of data breach where that uh, where fraudsters are able to see that information, all they're going to get is a specified token that is going to be essentially useless for them. So I think if anything, it's going to decrease the risk of future chargebacks. Uh, but with digital wallets itself, uh, I, I don't I don't believe that they come with any inherent chargeback risk that somebody, you know, uh, for a lot of these folks who are using digital wallets on, you know, on mobile, on the phone, it's, it, they oftentimes require a, a key code to put in that's on, on their personal device. Right. So the odds of that being a fraudulent transaction uh, are really slim and, and honestly can kind of help you in the representment process if it is, because uh, you can show, you know, hey, this is a digital wallet. It needed X, Y, Z on the cardholder side to be able to make this purchase. So it kind of helps you a little bit in terms of, uh, in terms of fighting that chargeback if you do receive one. Yeah, you know, and anytime you're offering your consumer base as many payment options as possible, transaction volume is going to go up, right? So when you increase your processing volume, you increase your risk exposure just like anything else. So friendly fraud may happen down the line. But like you said, if, you know, you're using it on your iPhone or your tablet. There's biometric technology that's looking at my face and saying, hey, Kellen's mm-hmm. face made this transaction. So that's really hard to refute that. But mm-hmm. if you're selling a product that maybe is being delivered, is not advertised, or your description, you know, so in that description of the product is off, I mean, that's where you could still kind of play in that field. Mm-hmm. But uh, to your point earlier, I mean, it makes it a lot harder for a fraudster to be able to take someone's digital wallet and run that transaction unless it's like a family pepper or using, you know, something else. But yeah, so I I don't think um, it increases your risk as far as transactional volume, but you know it's a lot harder to commit fraud with a digital wallet because of its checks and balances. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. All right, next question that we have is: How do I fight false chargebacks on informational products, including those from clients who use the service successfully for months? Um, Kellen, I'm, I'm gonna let you weigh in on that one first. Yeah. I mean, I think the first, the, the big thing is compelling evidence. You know, the CE 3.0 is definitely, uh, a huge advantage to businesses that are in that realm, because if you can look at your behavior, if your, your customers buying patterns and say, Hey, you know, Justin bought this product, the same product for me every month for, you know, the last 12 months, why is he why is he charging back that now? Mm-hmm. Depending on your level of repeat business on those false chargeback, representment goes a really long way. You know, so having all that data and somebody help you fight that data or fight that chargeback 
uh, is extremely important, you know, and then having, you know, just good logs, um, you know, good usage data definitely makes a huge difference in, in fighting those chargebacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then kind of going back to some of those, like those subscription services, you know, again, where you're, you're, you're using a product for a certain amount of time and then, you know, maybe charging it back like the week beforehand. Um, that's where it's always good to, you know, if there's any patterns that you can find as to like when they're happening and shore up your terms and conditions, your policies, uh, to help, you know, avoid that gap or avoid, um, you know, consumers taking advantage of that policy. Um, that's something that's going to help. And again, having that to, you know, clearly defined, um, especially at checkout, especially on follow-up communications directly with the customer. Um, again, that's something that you can submit as, as compelling evidence as well to, you know, um, to help enforce your policy and help overturn that charge back. Right. Especially if you're in a business vertical that is, you know, selling informational products, way more important to have more robust chargeback mitigation mm-hmm. to protect you. Uh, because you're working against a consumer that may say, oh, he gave me bad advice or what he told me didn't work and so on and so <laughs> forth. Uh, and if you have clear terms and conditions, a good usage policy, um, and, you know, the fact that this person has been with you for X amount of time, just... It, it, it's a big difference. Yeah. <laughs> Your product was supposed to make me smarter and I'm not, yeah. this was not as advertised, right? Exactly. <laughs> oh, perfect. All right. Uh, next question we have is, uh, can delayed deliveries lead to chargebacks? Uh, absolutely. Yes. Especially if those delays aren't communicated with the, with the customer. Which is um, that, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's really important to provide that that tracking number to, to them for them to to be able to view that themselves. But if there is any sort of delay, you know, setting up system that can automatically notify that consumer if uh, if there's going to be a delay in shipping. Because if they're not checking the tracking number and and it's you know supposed to be a five day delivery, and here we are on day ten and it hasn't come yet. Well, you know, the, it, it, the card holder is is going to assume that didn't come if they're, you know, if they're kind of if they're past that uh, that that point of of feeling like they wanted the product when they purchased it at the time, if not necessarily buyer's remorse, but they don't necessarily need the product as much as they felt they did a couple of weeks beforehand, it might be something where they just call the bank and, and get a chargeback if they think that it's not it's not sure. coming in. Jail. Yeah. And, you know, it's very important. If you know you're going to have a delayed delivery, it's important to put those notices on your website. Because if you're going to have a product that I buy today that's going to be delivered to me in three weeks, and I happen to be taking my kids out to ice cream and see that product at a retail store, I may just buy that product. Right. So (laughs) having that, you know, information readily available is super important. We see this a lot too with merchants that are partnering up with a drop shipping center that's not, you know, here in the States. Mm -hmm. You're really reliant on what's going on in the world at that point. If they have to go through a point of entry to deliver the goods here to the States, it, 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 it adds a level of difficulty there. And we see this especially happen, um, you know, if merchants are partnering with a fulfillment center in China, specifically in February, you know, because there's definitely delivery delays uh, in that month. And then, uh, you know, so it's important to have, you know, a domestic fulfillment center here in the middle of the States that you can get and process those those deliveries for you in a in a timely manner. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then just understand that, you know, what months uh are slower than others and how the economy strikes, whatever, affect that. Uh and mm-hmm. then it's just be as informative as possible. Hey, you know, just to let you know, Justin, your order is back ordered three weeks. Would you like to refund that order or would you like to wait? You know, having that dialogue documented, it really all goes a long way. Yeah, yeah. And especially if you're delivering internationally, you're kind of at the, uh, you're kind of at the whim of of, of international conflict, of weather, uh, you know, something, uh, uh, you know, a pipeline bursting overseas could right. disrupt, you know, supply chains over here. So especially if you're shipping products overseas, that's something you definitely want to, uh, you want to make sure you just have, have, have very reactive communication with uh, with right. with customers, and-, and it doesn't mean you can't partner with an offshore fulfillment center. I mean, it's there's a lot of advantages to that, but it's important to have an inventory management system that speaks directly to your your supplier. So you know you'll you'll see a lot of times where they don't, and someone purchases a product that's out of stock, right? Mm-hmm. So having those 
that that um, integration with your uh, inventory management system that will deplete the inventory as it's being go to remove the product from your website is definitely uh, featured highly recommended. Yeah, yeah. And having that contact information for your customer support line for any of those updates, you know, the featured at the top of your email, at the bottom of your email, if that's how you're communicating, you just want to make make it so that, you know, if they do have an issue or they do want to reverse it, that that first step is your first step, not the issuing bank's first step. So, you know, just so make them come to you and not the issuing bank. You're competing for convenience. We We really try to drive that home. Exactly. Is there a higher risk of fraud and chargebacks with last minute holiday purchases? Absolutely. <laughs> especially, especially kind of going into like the delays in shipment. I think everybody knows whoever's bought a Christmas gift uh, or a holiday. Twenty third purchase that's supposed to land on, on Christmas Eve. Yeah. And then it doesn't come. You admit, you know, it arrives on the 27th or the 28th instead. And, right. you know, what good is it then filing a chargeback? So. Uh, absolutely, uh, there is a higher risk for for last minute ones. And then you also got to keep in mind, we just kind of went over shipping beforehand, but a yeah, huge influx, especially in December, if you're if you're ordering your holiday gifts, then uh, it, it, these these postal services, these delivery companies are very inundated with gifts. There are going to be, you know, don't be surprised with three week delivery times or yeah. something of that sort. So if you're purchasing a, those those gifts around that time. And even if the expected delivery day is supposed to be a few days before the holidays, um, just, just keep in mind there, there could be, there could be delays. There are going to be more folks like you who are buying those gifts at that time. Uh, those delays could lead to charge us. Again, you're, you, you might be missing an important day to give that gift, whatever holiday you're celebrating. Um, you know, you're, you might miss that holiday. And at, at that point, you know, it's, it could be somebody who, you know, well, I don't necessarily need this now. Exam, and that's the risk that you run. Set so real shop big. early. <laughs> the big, it's the big. All right. Next question that we have, and this will probably be our last one, so we can let everybody get back to their day. But this last question that we have says: If we don't receive any update from the bank after defending the chargeback, can we take it as a win? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. Until until you get confirmation from. Uh, from the bank saying that the chargeback was ruled in your favor, uh, you can't necessarily take that as a win. You got to keep in mind the time frames that they give merchants to, uh, you know, submit their evidence. That there's the the cardholder has has more time to submit that. Uh, so there is that that back and forth of here's the evidence that was submitted by the merchant, and then that goes back to the cardholder and the issuing bank. So it so no response from the bank is is not a telltale sign that you have won that chargeback. Uh, definitely want to stay up to date on that decision. Uh, reach out to the issuing bank if you need to. Um, get with your payment processor on that if you have a question or if it's been a little while. Uh, but also you know make yourself privy to what those timelines are uh, for the different card networks on what those turnaround times are. Yeah, you just gotta stay proactive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Kellen, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you know, I, yeah. we we worked with you guys for a while, and you guys are are very trusted. So I'm really glad from you know getting the payment processors perspective on some of the th- uh, some of these things that we dove into. I'm really glad we had you guys on board. Um, uh, really insightful. I mean, you know, we we're we're kind of situated in between really everybody in the payment process. Um, so anytime we can get somebody who's working as closely with merchants as you guys are, uh, it, it really is insightful and really helps out a lot. Yeah. Thank you so much. We're excited to be a part of it. It's a, it's an exciting time. I mean, being prepared for the holidays, you know, you have all this excitement about, you know, the increase in transactions, everyone's making good spends. Uh, it's important to be prepared. And I think education goes a long way and having great partners like yourselves is, it, it, you know, it helps everything. Right? I would say rising tides lifts all, lifts all boats. So that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll, we'll definitely look to have you on again in the future. Um, but Absolutely. Thank you for everybody for tuning in to another episode of Charge Four with Chargebacks Number One. Um, as always, you can find more information on holiday shopping at www.chargebacksnumberone.com. Uh, be sure to check out our other episodes for topics that we've covered around retail payments, chargebacks and all things related. Um, 
Yeah, uh, Kellen, if, if folks want to find more information on Bankful, if folks are looking for a payment processor, uh, where, where can they go? Yeah, you can find us at our website, www.bankful.com. That's B-A-N-K-F-U-L.com. All right, perfect. Well, th- thank you again, everybody, for tuning in. Um, so take care, and we'll see you all on the next episode. Have a good one. <laughs>